Good morning, good morning. Welcome, welcome. So many beautiful faces. Hey, before we get started, if you have extra room on in between you and your seats, would you mind just scooting to the middle a little bit? It's already quite full. And as people are trickling in, it always makes it a little hard I'm trying to find a spot. There's always more room in here, right? I want there to be enough room for everybody. That's right. <laughs> These are basically like pews. So you don't have to use the whole chair. You can just scoot your little booty in. It's fine. <laughs> oh, man. I, uh, I was reflecting this morning on how really, truly, God creates a family. And so our little church community is an extension of God's family. And so uh, when we're celebrating big or, or we're um, grieving in a low spot, this this is meant to be like a family where we ride it out together. And, um, and I think there are times that it doesn't always look that way, but I think it should always be the goal in our hearts and our minds is I'm, I am, I'm a part of the family, especially if you love and trust Jesus, you're in. So you get the opportunity to invite people in. You get the opportunity, uh, to pull someone in a little closer. And, um, you know, there are some that are a part of the family that don't necessarily feel that way. And so maybe this morning, if you know you're in, you know you're in for the long haul with Jesus and his people, I would just encourage you, maybe pull somebody in to help them and remind them that they're a part of the family too. We're going to have a lot of fun today. You guys look great. I know that God's here. And I'm just excited to get to celebrate and sing uh, with you and worship him together. All right? Amen? Okay.
searched the world And I searched the world But it couldn't fill me And man's empty face And treasures the fame
Lord, we pronounce this morning again and again that there is nothing better than you. There is nothing. There's no one that compares to you, God. And so, Lord, we hope that in some way we are scratching the surface of what you are worthy of this morning. Lord, we thank you for your presence in this room. Lord, we haven't crowded you out this morning. That's amazing. But, Lord, we're so grateful for your spirit that is here with us now. And so, Holy Spirit, we invite your voice into our lives. Lord, we invite your strengthening into our spirits. Lord, we invite your healing into our bodies this morning. Lord, with things in this room, just because of your presence, start to come into alignment with the desires of your kingdom, God. Thank you that you're here with us. God, thank you that we can count on you being here. Lord, you didn't show up. We showed up. You're with us. So Lord, help us to enter into that more fully this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. Hey, welcome to church, everybody. Thanks for being here. We're going to have two services next week, guys, okay? Um, so just a heads up. It'll get a little better when the kids get dismissed, I promise. It's, it's wild. Um, hey, thanks for being here with us. If you're here visiting us, uh, you are our guest, and we are extra glad that you're here. Can we give our guests a warm welcome? Yeah. And if it's your first time in a long time, we're extra glad you're here. Can we give our first time in a long time guests a warm up? Amen. Amen. It's good to get to be together. And, you know, just by being here today, you have been entered into our Foliage of the Week Club. And so every week we hand out a different, um, you know, if that's, it goes with the, the name. No, that's not what's happening. Uh, today marks the beginning of Holy Week. This is a week that, for centuries, the church has remembered as the last week of Jesus' life. And there's, there's a lot of detail given in the gospel, a lot, of, a lot of the writings about his life, a lot of it's focused on this last week. And today marks the, the day that we remember that Jesus came into Jerusalem for the last time in this triumphant processional as the king, that, that people saw him coming in on, a, on like a baby donkey riding into the city, and they were shouting, Hosanna, which means God save us. And they, they took palm branches and they were waving them. They were laying them on the ground as Jesus entered. And I loved some, something I recently learned is uh, they were actually singing, singing one of their psalms that they had been singing that week. There was a collection of them that, that during this time for the Passover that was coming up, that the Jews would be celebrating, that they had certain psalms that they would be kind of singing together regularly. And one of them is Psalm 118, and it's where a lot of the language of what they're saying uh, comes from. So I wanted to give, wanted to back up and go forward a little bit and just give some of the context. Uh, imagine Jesus, the humble king coming into Jerusalem to do what they have no idea on this day what he's about to do. He's going to frustrate their expectations and then far surpass anything they could have asked or imagined. It says, Psalm 118, starting in verse 19, it says, Open for me the gates of the righteous. I will enter and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord through which the righteous may enter. I will give you thanks, for you answered me. You have become my salvation. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. The Lord has done it this very day. Let us rejoice today and be glad. Lord, save us. That's Hosanna. Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord, we bless you. The Lord is God, and he has made his light shine on us. With bows in hand, join in the feastal procession up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will praise you. You are my God, and I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, and his love endures forever. Amen. Amen. We have a special uh, prayer we're going to pray together. This is from the Book of Common Prayer. It's the, it's the uh, Palm Sunday Collect. And so let's pray this together with one voice. Almighty and ever-living God, in your tender love for the human race, you sent our Savior, 
Jesus Christ to take upon him our nature and to suffer death upon the cross, reconciling us to yourself and giving us the example of his great humility. Mercifully grant that we may walk in the way of his suffering and also share in his resurrection. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. As you were walking in, you received some palm branches. And so if you want to wave those during this time, this chorus, uh, we're going to be singing Hosanna. <clears throat>
about Jesus. Great is your name, God. Great is King Jesus, who walked and lived and breathed among us, and the one who still rules and reigns right now. We lift your name high. How worthy, how holy you are. We just want to honor you. We just, in your own words, just honor him for all that he did, but all that he's still doing in you. We thank you, God. We thank you, Lord. You're still working. Lord, the good work that you've started in us, you will be faithful to complete. How good, how faithful. Thank you, Jesus. ever reflect and just realize you you really haven't done a lot to get to Jesus, but he's done a lot to get to you. And he keeps doing it over and over and over again. I, I just think sometimes like, wow, how did my heart get so cold so fast? And yet God, in a moment of humility, you soften it immediately. And I feel close to you again. And it has nothing to do with me. It has everything to do with you. Sometimes I feel like all I've done is just say yes. But he's done. He's just done it all. And as we're singing this next song, I I just have been compelled by that truth and just the gratefulness that I really could not bridge the gap. But even still, his love and his kindness and his mercy, he is so generous with and he wants to give it to me. He's not withholding waiting for me to fill something out or to cross off all these checklists. It's like, when I say yes, God comes immediately in all of himself, just just to give it away. So Lord, it's hard to even express in words what kind of gratefulness that does in me. And so Lord, I, I just ask that you would hear our hearts and that there would be so much humility and tenderness in us that even when our words can't express how great you are, that our hearts would somehow touch your heart with gratitude and honor and joy. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb in desperation. Oh, come on, isn't that true? And then he shows up in all his wonder. Then through the darkness, oh, every time, tore through the shadows. Oh, you pierce through with a beautiful light. The work is finished. The end is written. Jesus Christ, my living, oh yes you are, the magic, so great a mercy, what heart could fathom such boundless grace, the God of
celebrating the God who saved us. And I see those palm branches one more time. Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So we're celebrating his salvation this morning. But we're also remembering that uh, with the church all over the world celebrating this, um, 2,000 years ago when everybody lined up and waved their branches and, and expected a coming king right now, a king that was going to come and overthrow the Roman Empire and, and change everything. And so very quickly, when those expectations weren't met, the cries of Hosanna changed to crucify him. And so um, I just want to invite us this week to enter in to all that Jesus faced and to remember both that we are vulnerable to those places of saying crucify him that we are vulnerable to all that Jesus faces as he moves into the week where he's betrayed, where he's denied, where he's left. His disciples can't stay awake with him, where he's abandoned, 
and then humiliated and even crucified to death. And the invitation for us is both to honor him in those, but also to notice that we're invited into solidarity with him because you guys, all, all of us, have faced some of these things on, on some level. And so this week, I just want to invite you to notice where, where are you facing and dealing with betrayal in your life? Where have you felt left alone? Where have you felt denied or humiliated? And our cry is, save us, Lord. Take us out of this situation. But oftentimes, God comes into our situation with us. So we want to say, Lord, help us to be willing to go all the way with you. To be faithful even when things don't turn out the way we expected or hoped. And to trust and look for you coming into our situations with us. And so that's what we're going to pray today. Um, well, actually, I want to read a verse first because we're remembering what happened 2,000 years ago. We're celebrating that the Lord saves us now, and we're looking forward to the future when everything will be made right and our king will be on the throne. So those palm branches that represented honor and were used for kings in Jesus' day are often found in the Bible for that same thing. And so I want to read a passage that shows us what we'll be doing when Jesus is on his throne and we are all worshiping together. It's from Revelation 7. And it says, After this I looked, and there was a vast multitude from every nation, tribe, people, and language which no one could number, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, and they were clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who is seated on the throne and to the Lamb. So we cry out with them, Salvation belongs to the Lord and to the Lamb. He's seated on his throne even now. And one day we will stand there with him. And so we celebrate that this morning. So we're going to move into a time of prayer. And here at Greenhouse, that looks like just gathering with the people by, by you and praising God and praying together for a couple minutes. We're going to praise God for the parade last week. That was amazing, wasn't it? Everybody was there. Yeah, thank God for the experience that people had serving here in the church and uh, and serving our city as we, as we showed them. The Sundays are for joy. Yeah. So we're going to thank God for that. And we're going to pray for those people that saw us and that were welcomed. And maybe some of you are here and we're so glad. Um, and then we're going to pray also for, for the rest of this week that we have the opportunities to enter into. And we have some of those with song and prayer tonight and night of worship. So we're going to ask God to anoint and bless those. And then finally, we're going to pray, Lord, help us go all the way. No matter what happens in our lives, help us to trust that you are with us, that you are for us, that you are saving us. So I'm going to give you a couple minutes and then I'll close this out in prayer.
thank you for your presence here this morning. We do cry out with our whole hearts, Hosanna, save us, Lord. We pray that uh, over our city too, Lord. Come, Lord Jesus, pursue people who, who saw you on display last week. Show them yourself, Lord. Would you meet us this week as we worship you, as we make space and hold space with you throughout Holy Week. And Lord, as we prepare to celebrate the height of our, um, of our faith, the glory of Easter, the glory of you defeating death. Prepare our hearts and our mind. Help us take it in at a new level, Lord. Don't let it just be a regular week, but help us meet you throughout this week preparing for it. Lord, we long to be people who are able and willing together as a community to go all the way with you, Lord. We love you, Lord. Amen. The prayer team would love to stand with you guys and pray with you guys. We have prayer team members back by the table after the service to pray, to celebrate with you, to cover you, to stand with you when you need protection. And we also have a card behind the seats where you can fill out prayer requests or you can text the word greenhouse to 94000 and you will get a form that you can fill out prayer requests. And I send those out in a confidential email to our prayer team every week. And we'd love to pray with you and stand with you. All right, uh, if you are in kindergarten through fifth grade, we're going to have our kids transition over here and get ready to go upstairs and do some Palm Sunday celebrations and activities. If you're not kindergarten through fifth grade, uh, stand up, greet somebody around you, squeeze in, find some extra seats. Bonus challenge, what's your favorite Easter candy? Talk to somebody about your favorite Easter candy. Go. All right, good morning, good morning. What did, I, what did I say was my favorite Easter candy? Oh, Starburst jelly beans. Starburst jelly beans. Don't even, don't even. Brandon, what was yours? Um, anything but Peeps. If your choice, yep. It, if your choice was Peeps, there are some um, prayer team afterwards that they can help with your heart and your taste buds, and we can get that taken care of. Nerds clusters? What? Alyssa and Jared. I don't think that's Easter. Is it officially branded with a bunny? Everything belongs to the Lord. Everything belongs to the Lord. All right. 
Well, hey, thanks for having fun with us today. Thanks for coming. We're so excited. If you're new around here, um, just welcome, welcome. If you are new, there is this card in the seat back pocket in front of you, and it has some good information on here to just kind of get you oriented. But um, we also have some check boxes. If you are looking for a home church, if you're looking for prayer, if you are looking um, to get baptized, if you're looking to jump in, there's lots of check boxes on here. And if you fill this out, drop it in one of the drop boxes on your way out the door, then we will be in touch. And so we'd love um, to get connected to you. We have a couple of announcements of what's happening in the next couple of weeks. And one of the ones that I want to point out is uh, this Friday, on Good Friday, if you want an extra dose of what happened this morning of worship, we'll have Night of Worship on Friday. Yes. Wonderful time to praise the Lord. Um, just really kind of get your hearts ready for Easter Sunday. And if you are, you know, one of those people or families that has little children, there is child care available. If you could just mark on Realm that you're going to bring your kids and how many, it's $5 per child. Or if you have more than two kids, it's just 10 bucks per family. So Kayla and David, I actually thought they are almost ready for their child care discount. Yeah. yeah. So two kids right now, about to have a third. Once they get across that three line, 10 bucks. 10 bucks no matter how many you have at that point. So I've heard it gets cheaper the more children you have. Didn't happen in our family, but that's okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, I want to bring to your attention, next Sunday we have Easter service. We have two services next Sunday. We have it at 9 and 11. Um, things I want to be able to bring to your attention, donut wall, photo booth. There is a great, great celebration that we can come together. We can rejoice uh, Jesus overcoming death and triumphing in that way. Um, hey, something that Jared told us a couple weeks ago and we've been using at home, there are these invites down below your seat. Stop saying no for people. Okay, so your roommate, your coworker, that person that you've been thinking about and you've considered inviting them, stop saying no for them. I bet they don't want to come. Why wouldn't you want to invite them into this family, into this group, and this experience? So take these with you. Easy invitation. You don't have to remember the dates and times. Just pass those along. Be intentional in that way um, and so that we can bring more people into this group and family here. So um, anything else? All right, let's pass it on to Pastor Sean there. <laughs> All right. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Uh, just uh, like to start real quick as we're kind of continuing in a, in a heart of worship uh, to remind you that our giving and our generosity to the Lord and to this church is an act of worship and obedience to him. And so we'd love to invite everybody around here into that. Um, and one of the reasons, one of many, many reasons is that we believe that giving brings joy yeah. because no one's ever met a joyful, stingy person. <laughs> they, might, they might think they're happy, but the deep, long-lasting, abiding joy does not come from being stingy. It's from being a person who gets to give and participate in awesome things that are going on. And so just as a reminder, the parade that we're celebrating that happened last week, that's, that's built on people around here that are in the game giving so that we can do awesome stuff like hand out just gobs of candy and uh, build a float and bring the kingdom uh, joy expression to the city in the parade because people around here are faithful and sacrificial in their giving. And so we invite everybody around here to do that, uh, not by arm twisting or manipulation or anything like that, but because we actually believe that it brings kingdom joy into our hearts. Amen. Amen. If you'd like to give, there's a bunch of ways to do it. Um, you can give online. There's envelopes in the seat back. Um, all sorts of ways, and then there's the boxes right there, the drop boxes on your way out today. Lord, we thank you for your generous heart towards us. Lord, that we're just, we're just trying to mimic in a very small way uh, the outrageous generosity we've received from you and recognize that every good gift that we have comes from you. And so, Lord, we love you and we thank you. We ask that you would bless every person around here who's in the game, giving and making what we get to do possible the bit that we get to do of bringing your kingdom into the city and putting it on display uh, with so many other awesome little families of God around us in this city too. We love you, Lord, and we thank you. And God, we ask that you'd uh, continue to speak to us this morning. Lord, we thank you for a sweet time together already. And uh, Lord, we ask that as we open the scriptures, Lord, that they would, uh, that your spirit would amplify them 
and these words and this time we're about to share together in a way that speaks to the deepest part of who we are. Lord, my words can be fleeting and foolish and sarcastic and forgettable and all sorts of, of uh, things that miss the mark. But Lord, your word, it's always on time. It's always effective. It's always powerful. And so, Lord, that's what we want to receive this morning. We love you, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, I got to tell you, after our time of worship this morning, I literally feel like I'm preaching to the choir this morning. So uh, here we go. Um, I think I've told, I told you all, I think, this before, but I've had many different, like, stages growing up of, like, what I wanted to be when I grew up. And 100% of the things that I wanted to be as a kid um, involved me becoming famous one way or another. Like, I thought I wanted to be a celebrity. I think it's funny when people are like, I, when I was a kid, I really wanted to be a firefighter. I was like, I didn't have time for thinking I wanted to be a firefighter. I wanted to be famous. I wanted everyone to love me, okay? And so I needed more people than just, like, you know, firefighter recognition. I can't just save one person's life. i got to have people think I'm, like, the best at whatever. So there was, you know, there were a lot of weird faces in that. And I, I think, um, you know, head and shoulders above the rest of the phases of the things that I thought I wanted to do with, with my life. And, um, you know, I'm hesitant to admit how old I was when this was the dream of my life, okay? But I, I thought, I'd like to be a professional wrestler. Wow. Yep, yeah, I really, really wanted to be a professional. And not like, not like, not like, you know, like real wrestling. I'm talking about like, Male soap opera wrestling is what I'm talking about, okay? Because there was about a three or four year period of my young life where, um, where before I knew Jesus, essentially WWF, as it was called at that time, okay, now it's WWE, uh, was my religion, basically. I mean, we watched it every Monday, and then it was every Thursday, and then they had stuff on Sundays, and then we conned our parents into buying the pay-per-views every month, and every time our parents weren't home, me and my three brothers were just, uh, you know, figuring out, like, which cookie sheets we could hit each other in the head with and not have it hurt, <laughs> building pallets in the living room. The trampoline was just an all-out, like, wrestling ring. Uh, just all, I mean, it was outrageous. We were practicing, and w- one of the things is uh, this was probably... The one time in my life that I was super motivated to start going to the gym, like on a regular basis, my brother and I, uh, my oldest little brother and I, in like even the worst weather, would make our way. We lived in a little town, and so we'd like ride our bikes or go walk. It was like a 20-minute walk to get to the gym uh, probably three or four times a week. And this lasted, you know, for like several months, and that was kind of big for me that we did that that long. But something that I knew about my goal of being a wrestler in kind of my frame. You know, imagine me uh, about the same height, but about 60 pounds lighter, okay, is probably about where I was. I was like, I've got to uh, beef up. I got to get stronger. And so I knew that there was something I had to do. I had to engage my body in this goal that I had. And so uh, I want to reflect a little bit on that today. But I want to start out, we're going to be talking a bit about Palm Sunday and Jesus coming into Jerusalem but first, I want to talk about kind of this wild story in uh, 2 Chronicles 23. And so let's open our Bible to 2 Chronicles 23. Yes. Amen. Now, if you're not familiar with the books of Kings and Chronicles, they, they detail um, a very, very dark and wild time in Israel and Judah's histories. Okay, so the people of God are torn into two nations at this time. They have two different kings in Israel, which is the northern kingdom, and then there's Judah, which is the southern kingdom. Um, And it's just, it's so far from what God's ideal for them was when they were in the desert and they were going to come into this land that it's just, it's completely, completely broken. And so there was a wicked king in Judah who goes to do something with the king of Israel, and he dies. And his mother decides to seize power for herself. And so she goes and kills all of her, I believe it's male children and male grandchildren, to leave no survivors to be able to make a claim for the throne so that she can be the queen of Judah. And so she spends six years in this position. And this is about, just to give... um, some, some reference for where we are. This is about 800 years before Jesus. And so Grandma Athalia rages. She kills all of her grandkids. But she leaves. Um, there, there's a little baby named Joash that gets saved out of this by his aunt. 
he's, he's a baby, and she goes and hides him in the temple for six years so that there will be some sort of heir to the throne. And so they're stuck in this kind of situation, uh, and they get to this day that comes when, you know, this child is ready to be made king and ready to kind of stand up against his grandma who's been kind of usurping and overtaking the throne, um, you know, at the, at the perfectly ripe age of seven, they decide now is the time we're bringing, like, right? That's like, we would all, that's perfect. So at seven years old, they have this day where they beef up security at the temple and they're ready for like this big reveal of like, hey, you thought you killed them all off, but here's the heir to the throne. And so a seven-year-old boy is crowned king. And so we'll pick up Second Chronicles 23, Verse 11, so Jehoiada, this is, this is the priest at the time, and his sons brought out the king's son and put the crown on him. They presented him with a copy of the covenant and proclaimed him king. They anointed him and shouted, long live the king. Now when Athaliah heard the noise of the people running and cheering the king, she went to them at the temple of the Lord. She looked, and there was the king standing by his pillar at the entrance. The officers and the trumpeters were beside the king, and all the people of the land were rejoicing and blowing trumpets, and musicians with their instruments were leading the praises. And Athaliah tore her robes and shouted, treason, treason. There's, there's a sound that's coming out of the temple. There is rejoicing and singing and, and proclaiming this new king that lets this wicked woman know that her time is up. There's, there's something that goes on here with this. And so she ends up, uh, her and her followers end up being put to death because that's just how things went back then. But Joash becomes king and he rules for 40 years and he has all sorts of reforms in his lifetime. They start rebuilding the temple which had been used for worshiping all kinds of other gods. But this outward celebration announces the people's allegiance to this new king. It puts the enemies on alert of what's going on. It's loud, it's public, and it's a release from the corrupt rule of uh, this woman. And so they clapped and shouted, and there were trumpets all to celebrate a king. With, it was like this natural release that just came out of him and this excitement and this buzz that went on. And so with that in mind, I want to read Psalm 47. And this is the part where it's going to start feeling like we're preaching to the choir. It says, clap your hands, all you nations, and shout to God with cries of joy. For the Lord Most High is awesome. He's the great king over all the earth. He subdued nations under us, peoples under our feet. He chose our inheritance for us, the pride of Jacob, whom he loved. God has ascended amid shouts of joy. The Lord amid the sounding trumpets. Sing praises to God, sing praises. Sing praises to our king. Sing praises, for God is the king of all the earth. Sing to him a psalm of praise. I want to talk a little bit about this idea of how and why we engage our bodies uh, in worship. And, and just about the reality that we live in embodied faith. That it requires us getting our physical bodies in the game to follow and obey Jesus. And so first, I want to give... Uh, the, the, a working definition we've run with for a long time about what worship is around here. Worship is a response to finding beauty or value. It's a natural response. And we as humans have a natural desire to just be around and experience greatness. It's why like the Grand Canyon is such a thing. Millions of people going there every year to experience just the grandeur and the, the beauty and the amazement of it. To stand, at, to stand at the shoreline and look at the ocean that looks like it never ends. There's something about that that just is naturally compelling to us to go and do these things. We have a need to worship. And we also see frequently that we become like the thing we worship. It takes control of our lives. And so it's one of the things we talk about giving is that giving brings joy. And if we worship money... It leads to a very dark place. So today, uh, talking a bit about the way our bodies play in worship, because we aren't just physical or spiritual people. We are like this wildly complex intermingling of all that we are. I remember I worked um, at a community health center for a little while, 
And our CEO one time was talking about, it had never struck me before how weird it is that we section off our mouths from all other like physical care that we do. You know, like it is a specialty and it does require special things. I'm not saying anything about that. But what I is saying is I've never thought about my, my oral health having any other impact on any other part of my body because of the way that we just kind of like, we split those apart into very different, you go to the doctor or you go to the dentist, but there's nothing that's combined about those things. And I remember him making a remark one time that just struck me like, isn't it weird that we kind of section off this whole part, it is part of our body and it is part of our physical health, but for some reason we completely detach these things from each other. Or the first time I had a friend who talked about how he was trying to eat better because he knew that it would affect his body and the mood that he would have and the way that he would feel throughout the day. You know, and I was like older than I want to admit when I realized like, oh, you're right. When I eat junk and it makes me feel bad, I'm a horrible person <laughs> because my, my body... My mental health, my emotional health, my spiritual health, all of those things, they are so intricately tied together that it seems silly sometimes when we try to take one apart from the other. It's a lot harder to follow Jesus on a Monday when I didn't get seven hours of sleep at least the night before. I, I, I fail a lot more at being Christ-like when I have not had rest. And so all of these things, they go together. And so uh, we have this wild connection for our heart kind of expressing, um, or our bodies expressing stuff that's going on in our hearts. And I think kids know this better than anybody because they haven't learned to know better. They haven't, they haven't realized like how to kind of keep those things in. But we, are, we can often have a lot going on and we've disciplined ourselves to keep it in. And so I just, just for the sake of, of joy and you guys getting to be a part of this, um, I have one of the greatest expressions of joy I've ever seen in my life on video. This is Baby Ryder. He is about 13 months old. And... Uh, Oh, here we go. I'm turning on Yo Gabba Gabba for him. So at 13 months old, this guy had not learned yet to contain the heart emotions from his physical body. And he could not. He could not contain it. And I'd say right now, boy, I still see you doing that. And I mean, on Sunday mornings, this guy up here, I look over and it, okay, I can't do that. But I'm proud of you. <laughs> Frequently, our hearts find their language through our bodies. And I do think kids display this a lot better than we frequently do. But we see this moment with, with this new king coming in, and this thing happening, and the people can't contain what's going on. I remember the first time the Broncos won the Super Bowl. I think the year was 1998. Maybe 97. I get confused how these things work. I was a child living in Denver, okay? I was born and raised in Denver. I was born in... He is. Mahomes is better than Elway. It's fine. But Terrell Davis is still the greatest running back of all time. And I remember just, guys, the anguish of being a kid that loved sports in Denver in the 90s, okay? Like, okay, I guess... Never mind. I can't. I can't with the Kansas City people. Never. You had it worse. But listen. <laughs> listen. You all understand when, you, when like your team finally reaches that point. I was probably like 10, 11 years old, and I could not contain jumping on my grandparents' couch, which I would never do on any other occasion. You know? It wasn't like my house now where my kids think that the couch is the indoor trampoline. We did not jump on grandma's couch. But when the Broncos won the Super Bowl... That was the time that you got to jump on grandma's couch and just go nuts. Could not contain the joy. Our, our, our hearts finding, phys finding their language through our bodies. When you pull in a friend and give them a hug when they're going through a hard time. It's, it's where you feel that I'm trying to control my body in a tense meeting. It's showing up for, for friends without asking. It was... 
when, when my firstborn was born, not being able to stay on my feet in the delivery room. It was a similar response when there was horrible news about my family five years later about something that was going on. It was my grandma seeing me and my oldest little brother in the pool at Glenwood Springs. If you've never been, I can't recommend it highly enough. And some kids that were a little older than us starting some stuff with us in the pool. And she saw this. There's, she's up these like little stairs at a table. And my grandma in her little, you know, 50-something years old, in her bathing suit, she, I don't think she'd had her nose plug on because she had the same problem I have where we don't know how to keep water going in our nose. I will never forget her running down the stairs, like cannonballing into the pool and getting in these kids' faces and saying, no. And I think, you know, they, they saw their lives flash before their eyes from this little, like, five-foot-two fierce grandma right there. Her heart for us gave her body, uh, uh, made her body react and have this physical expression. And so oftentimes, I think this happens all the time in following Jesus, but there's something in, in worship where we engage uh, our bodies, clapping, raising hands, dancing, kneeling, looking up, looking down. There's a natural sort of overflow reaction to recognizing how, how beautiful and how valuable God is, how good he's been to us, how loving he's been to us, the kind of, the kind of king that he is to us, and that there's nothing else like him. And so it deserves, it just, it just causes something to well up in us and to overflow. We see this picture in, in the Palm Sunday story in Luke 19. Uh, I want to read through this. It says, after Jesus had said this, so this is after he's told them a story, it's, it's the time to go into Jerusalem. And as he approached Bethpage and Bethany at the hill called Mount of Olives, he, t- he got two of his disciples and he said to him, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever written, ridden, which this detail of no one ever writing it uh, makes it available for sacred use, that it hasn't been used for any other purposes. And so he says, untie it and bring it here. And if anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Say, the Lord needs it. The Lord who were sent, uh, those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, the, its owners asked him, why are you untying the colt? And they replied, the Lord needs it. And I just did See, that's, that's how it should be found Jesus. He says, do this, and you do this. He says, say this, you say this. That's actually all we're trying to do around here. So they brought it to Jesus. They threw their cloaks on the colt, and they put Jesus on it. And so Jesus prepares to ride into Jerusalem. And it's my understanding that, that someone riding a donkey in was... Uh, would be a king that's coming for a civil procession, not a military procession. So I got to wonder if even already as people are start to cry out as we're about to read, if there's a little bit of confusion like, okay, the symbol he's using looks like something that's, that's bringing peace or that's during peacetime, and we're kind of expecting like military king Messiah to come in here and beat up on the Romans. But Jesus comes as Zechariah had prophesied, as opposed to being the expected militaristic Messiah. And I think, I think we always have to remember this, and this is a side note and a whole bunch of other sermons probably, but God is not beholden to our expectations, yeah. even now. Yeah. I think it's easy for us to look back then and go, oh man, those guys, they missed it and he showed them. I think in my life repeatedly, in close to 20 years of following Jesus, he has done the same thing to me over and over. Yeah. And sometimes it's really uh, disorienting, but in the end, it, the further you get away from it, you go, oh, he did the more beautiful and better thing than I could have possibly imagined. And so as he went along, the people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down to the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began to joyfully praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Now some of the Pharisees, in the crowd, said to Jesus, teacher, rebuke your disciples. They're worried about the noise that's being made. They're worried about, they think they're idolaters and they're worshiping a a false prophet. And he says, I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones are going to cry out. Creation itself won't be able to contain what's going on internally. 
if people around here aren't crying out? And so something for us to think about today is when it comes to loving God, what effect has it had on your body? I would hope that we are quick to engage with God to display externally the internal reality of what he's doing. And I think we're all learning how to, to not stifle that and push it down. But I know, I think there's been times where I've had a reluctant posture in worshiping the Lord. And it's mimicking my reluctance to obey him and get my body engaged in another way with him. Where it can actually be a sign of my hard-heartedness is not allowing me to get involved here. Where I might say, oh, it's just, you know, I'm feeling a little more reserved, but really it's a, it's a pride kind of thing that happens. Because oftentimes also on the flip side, our freedom in, in corporate worship can mimic our, our spiritual freedom in the day-to-day. Sometimes it's easy to tell when you've been around people and enjoyed the Lord a lot with them. Like, I can just tell from the way you're engaging right now that you are not doing well. Or I can tell right now that you've had some real breakthrough. And so you might say, that's all fine, but what about when my heart isn't feeling it? And so to talk about that a little bit, I want to talk about uh, the 2019 U.S. Gymnastics Championships. I got to go. And it was really cool. And Vera was really into gymnastics at this time, and it was a really special thing. We got the hookup. We got to sit in these, like, box seats. And uh, if I can just, full disclosure, uh, figure skating, gymnastics, um, probably a bunch of other, you know, uh, high diving, all of these kind of things, every single thing people do looks the exact same to me. Maybe in diving, it's like, if you're standing backwards or forwards, it looks different from that aspect. But I'm like, I can't possibly count how many times um, they spun or flipped or, you know, how to judge that splash. I, I saw something where someone was <laughs> slowed down and showed every points deduction one time on, like, a gymnastics thing where it's like, oh, legs are too far apart. They're more than shoulder width. They did this. They did that. And it was all these, like, tiny things. And I'm like, I don't know how these judges could possibly be seeing these things and judging these things. Like, their talent might be more impressive than the gymnasts even to spot these things. <laughs> But I have to say, even with all of that, that was like, I've got no idea what I'm watching. I just know it's a bunch of stuff that I can't even dream. I've never even dreamt of doing the kind of things they're doing. But Simone Biles, you guys, was on another, I mean, probably still is, but was on another level. I mean, just to the naked eye, as someone who doesn't know gymnastics, the way she would jump and spin and move was completely different. And these are the, you know, the top 0.0001% of gymnasts in the world. And she was just on a completely different level. And so in that, in that event, she, she landed two things that no one had ever done before. And, and one of them was this, uh, let me see what it was called, double twisting, double, double somersault dismount. So coming off of the balance beam, she did like a back handspring, and then to get off of it, she did a double backflip and a 720 and landed on her feet. She's the only person, not just woman, but the only person to ever land this thing. It was insane. It was what all the buzz, you know, in Kansas City was about, was how she did this. I believe it was called the Sprint Center then, is where this took place. It is amazing, with practice, all that we can do, uh, all that we can train our bodies to do. Now, none, none of us in this room are probably going to land that exactly. But I think it's amazing the things that we can train our bodies to do as humans. And it's amazing how our bodies can lead us and train us too. Because in worship, our bodies are actually training us as well. There's another Psalm, uh, Psalm 63. It's when David is in the desert. And, and he's in hiding. And he's in this dark place. And you got to love that the Psalms give voice to all the different range of human emotions and experiences. And David says, oh God, you are my God. Earnestly, I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you. 
as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. This is the place where you could feel like, I can't get my heart to be in the game. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory. Because your steadfast love is better than life, because I know this, even if I'm not feeling it, my lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. In your name, I will lift up my hands. I will make myself engage with you. My soul will be satisfied as with fat and rich food, and my mouth will praise you with joyful lips. Sometimes you need your body to lead your heart. And that can feel counterintuitive. And I think sometimes we get scared that we're being fake when we get there. You get scared that you're being fake when you get there. But I found that, that doing the action often is what brings my heart along with my body. So you need to be able to direct your body to direct your heart, direct your heart to direct your body, and inspire hope. And even in a place of lament, we see throughout the scriptures over and over and over again that even lament has physical expression to it. That it's not a place of just like shutting down, but there is a proper way to express lament uh, in those seasons. And so corporate worship, these times that we come together and we sing, I would never say this is all we're doing when we worship in, the, in, a, in a setting like this because there's so many things that we're doing. It's an, It's really engaging God. It's real worship to God. It's real honor to him. It's all sorts of different things. But one of the things that we're doing in this setting at this time is training our bodies to get involved in our faith. It's like wanting to be a professional wrestler and going to the gym. You have to go and create the habit and do the training to grow. Another beautiful thing that happens here is that engaging our bodies in worship encourages and calls others to worship. And if you didn't experience that this morning, we might need to check your pulse. I, I, I love being up here because I look out at the room and I'm just like, Lord, I'm so grateful to be a part of a people that love you and are committed to you and are following you. common saying we had at, at retreats that, that we would do and in, in just around the church was that outwardly expressed worship, letting people see what's going on in your heart, displays a tenderness for the Lord for the next generation to be able to model. It's not about performing or trying to uh, whatever, but it is a byproduct of what goes on. So our big idea, kind of our whole main point of, of what we're getting into today, the overarching, even above and beyond just talking about worship and how we engage, is that following and honoring Jesus requires that we get our bodies involved in the game. It's how we worship. It's how we serve. It's how we express love to our brothers and sisters and to those around us. It's how we give the gift of presence our bodies were created to be engaged in our faith and in our worship. I remember my very first time of going to uh, what was called vertical. <laughs> and it was the youth ministry at what was called Life Church. <laughs> that is now Life Mission Church. And uh, I was 18 years old. I was technically graduated and too old to be at the student ministry. But uh, I don't know. It looked like it was fun. So I decided I wanted to go. So I went on a Wednesday night, and I met the most friendly person I have ever met in my life. It was Ben Eggers, okay? Any, any Ben Eggers knowers around here? Yeah. Ben creeped me out. He was so kind to me when he met me. He shook my hand and rubbed my forearm and looked me so intensely in the eyes. And I've never felt like someone was happier to see me in my entire life, and he did not know me. It's like, wow, this guy, it was kind of, if I'm honest, it was a lot. And then we started singing, and I remember standing there, and it was, it was such a new experience to me because I had so little, like, church experience in my life growing up. And I looked over, and Ben was on the floor kneeling in worship, and, and, I mean, it looked like he was weeping. And I remember thinking at that time, there was, it was such a sense of, like, kind of judgment towards him. 
like, wow, that's... Something felt warm and great about all of this. Something about it felt kind of off and weird, if I'm honest. I kept coming around, and God kept working on me. And I remember getting to the point, like, the first day I, like, decided to lift my hands. And the time I, I fell to my knees before the Lord, and the time that I wept in worship, and I started to understand what it was that Ben was experiencing. It wasn't weird. It wasn't putting on a show. It was that this guy got something that I didn't get at that time. And so there might be something to stepping out a little bit more in the way we engage that might help us to get it a little bit more. I'm afraid that some of us might be missing out on something. So the good news for us today to shift it just a little bit is that God's heart for us required physical expression. That God himself looked on this creation that we had completely wrecked and laid waste. The kind of world where a grandma would kill her grandsons to be able to take the throne and then would have to, and then would, to get revenge on her, be killed herself. is so far removed from the picture of what he had created and what he had intended. But he continued to love to the point that it required him to take on flesh and have physical representation on the earth. To express his heart for us, it required God to embody his love and put it on physical display. And so it's my hope this week that as we're entering into Holy Week, that 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 is an image that would that would sit with us as remembering what Jesus went through this week, what he was feeling, what he was looking forward to, the things that he was saying to his disciples. And we go, that is our God. That's who he is. That's the level of love and care he's shown for us. And so I thought it'd be fitting as we close out here to just take a few minutes to stand up together again and to continue to practice this engaging with God, with our bodies, with our words, with our heart posture. We serve a God that took on flesh and embodied his love for us. May we return that gift at some level to him. Amen? Amen. Let's sing together.
Amen. Yes, God. Lord, you are worthy of every expression of praise and exaltation in our lives, Lord. We announce you as King Jesus. Lord, your kingdom is like no other kingdom, and we are so glad to get to live into it. And so, Lord, we proclaim you as King, as the loving, benevolent King. Lord, we love you, and God, we thank you. Lord, would you bless my friends as they go, and would you prosper every good work they put their hands to this week for your kingdom's sake. We love you, Lord. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. Hey, thanks again for being here today. Just a reminder, we've got a lot going on this week. There's song and prayer tonight at 6, night of worship Friday at 7, and then next Sunday, services are at 9 and 11. Invite someone to come with you, all right? We love you guys. Have a great, great week.